I'm Jen, and this is the long and short of it. I'm joined today by two fantastic other co-hosts. Guys, do you want to introduce yourselves real quick? Uh, I'm TJ from Everrise. I'm uh, Ty from Blackworks. And today's topic, it's wallets. So we've been seeing a lot of things on the news, especially across Celsius, Voyager, and a couple of other what I would consider centralized finance organizations and how they're freezing funds. And the three of us started talking and we're like, God, this is why knowing what a wallet is and how to use a wallet specifically in DeFi is so important. Guys, if we were to zoom out from a really broad level, what is a wallet and how does it work? This is a wallet, right? This is your wallet, your everyday wallet. But we're all here in DeFi. So a DeFi wallet, we're talking Trust Wallet, we're talking MetaMask, SafePal, all sorts of different kinds of hot wallets, if you will. There's also cold wallets, something like this, which is a ledger. Uh, Ty, I'll let you kind of dive into that if you'd like. Yeah, I, the difference between a wallet you can hold and a wallet in DeFi is that it's really just an address on the internet, right? That stores assets, that your assets are allocated to. So instead of you know, having a wallet with your cards in it, you just have a place on the internet to store, you know, whether it's NFTs, whether it's your crypto, Bitcoin, whatever it is, where it just holds it in there and then but you need your keys to access it and you're the only one that has it. Yeah, so a really popular saying in crypto is not your keys, not your crypto. And this is really important because ultimately from a technical perspective, essentially what that wallet does is it acts as your way to interact with the blockchain. So when you hear of Ethereum or all these tokens that are all built in crypto and ultimately there's a smart contract for that token or for that coin and your wallet allows for you to interact with that smart contract. And the key thing to note about keys is if you own the keys, that means you own the crypto. It is a non-custodial wallet. You are completely in charge of all the digital assets that you're storing in there. However, when we look at some of these centralized entities that exist within the Web3 space, and I'm thinking of the Binances, the Coinbases, Celsiuses, Voyagers of the world are essentially what it's considered is a custodial wallet is they are storing the crypto on your behalf, but ultimately they have complete say as to what happens to it. So when you're looking at, you know, things like Celsius stopping withdrawals, freezing funds, Voyagers halting withdrawals and freezing funds, the reason why they're able to do that is because they ultimately own the keys to the wallet that you would be storing your crypto in. One of the big reasons I like DeFi and I don't touch centralized exchanges is because if I take my one Bitcoin, we're going to call this my Bitcoin, and I send it over to an exchange, I don't own this Bitcoin anymore. My account will say, I have one Bitcoin, it's worth this much money, but it's actually not in my wallet. It's in the exchange's hot wallet. A lot of exchanges have many hot wallets containing billions and billions of dollars worth of assets, but I'm not in control of it anymore. And we've seen you know, over the last month, exchanges have completely halted withdrawals. If I needed that Bitcoin, you know, for some reason to pay my bills or, to, you know, put food on the table or make my car payment, I can't withdraw it from an exchange, which is why I wholeheartedly believe in DeFi and owning your funds. Not your keys, not your crypto is so important. And, you know, the majority of investors in crypto are on centralized exchanges. CZ mentioned that I think it was 90% or just around 90% of crypto is actually held on centralized exchanges as opposed to DeFi. That to me screams DeFi needs to grow and DeFi will grow. Yeah. And that's not to say that centralized exchanges are a bad thing, right? Like I like to no. keep my money on exchanges because I like to trade, right? Like I like, I like to flip different yep. things and be in different things all at the same time, right? So it's not that centralized exchanges are bad. It's that it's a lot of risk to hold for not a lot of reward, right? Because you can hold your Bitcoin and, you know, reap the rewards of the appreciation of an asset in your own wallet, right? But to risk putting it in somebody else's wallet 
and they can just say, no, we're, we're pausing withdrawals, you don't get a lot of reward for that. There are definitely some benefits to having your crypto in a custodial wallet. And there's benefits to having it in a non-custodial wallet. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that's going to boil down to like where you are as a user, right? As someone who holds a digital asset, what makes the most sense for you? And I think like the thing with like having something like a Binance or storing your crypto within Binance, where there is a centralized authority is like, God forbid, maybe your security hygiene hasn't been great and your account gets hacked. And if you're able to provide, you know, police reports and evidence that you lost user funds due to, you know, a malicious actor or a bad actor in this space, there's a chance that you're able to recover those funds. Whereas, you know, when you move to a non-custodial wallet and you're truly playing in the realm of decentralized finance, like you and only you are in charge of your financial products, which means God forbid, you know, maybe you weren't that good with your security hygiene again, and then your wallet gets hacked. Unfortunately, if you lose those funds, they it becomes next to impossible to recover. You know, just to recap, what we're trying to do here is, is touch on what traditional finance is, the options that you have there, and then what DeFi is, and centralized finance, and like how each of these things interact with each other, right? And so... If I have my wallet, right, like my physical wallet, now we're talking about the traditional wallet, and it is my credit card or credit cards, all somebody to make purchases on my behalf, the only thing they need is my credit card number and my zip code, right? Like these things are pretty accessible. Like on my Twitter, I think it says that I live in Austin, right? And so like somebody knows where I'm, it's not that hard to steal my credit card number especially with how advanced these guys get. In DeFi and centralized finance, your keys are a randomly generated 12 words that if a hacker was going to try and figure them out, it would take them like billions of years to actually get the right combination of words. They're so, it's so secure and as long as you keep your, uh, your keys safe, even adding another layer is a cold wallet which never even connects to the internet. So now if you want to make purchases on my behalf, not only do you need the password to my laptop, you need the 12 to 24 gener randomly generated words, and then you need the physical cold wallet to connect to that computer that has another pin, yeah, TJ, uh, that has another pin on it, right? Your money is so safe. And so if we're comparing the traditional market with with exactly with DeFi, like you don't actually own your money because it's in a bank and your bank holds your money, right? You with a wallet can actually hold safely and more secure uh, your own assets and become your own bank. And you know that's that's another thing. If your you know if your funds are in a bank in a bank account, the bank is holding your money, likely lending it out to someone else. That, I mean, that's, that's exactly. literally how banks make money, TJ. Like, you, yeah, you <laughs> deposit money in there and they go, great, we're going to take your deposit and we're going to use it to finance Susie's auto loan and we're going to charge her like an 8% interest rate while we give you 0.0006% interest on your savings account. That's literally how banks make money. And it, to me, it's, there has to be a better way. And there is a better way. It's owning your own funds. A good example of this, and there was a transaction that went through last week. I don't know exactly what the, what the transaction was, but I do know that it was for half a billion dollars and the transaction fee was a dollar and 73 cents. If I go to the bank and I want to take out $20,000, I need three pieces of ID. I need an interrogation with the queen. It's, it's a whole list of things that you need. A individual wallet is able to send that much money at one given moment without having to jump through hoops because it is their money, period. Yeah. And they're in control of it. Yeah, I think it's funny, like when you think about your actual purchasing power in traditional finance, right? Like you may have 50 grand in the bank, but if you, you have limits on your debit card, your daily limits of like, hey, 
that's great that you have 50K in the bank, but you can't spend more than three grand a day or else we're going to decline the transaction. Like that's, that's a problem. You know, you owe, you have the money anyways. It's just not accessible to you because there's so many middlemen in the way. And I think like, that's what we love about DeFi as TJ was saying. Um, TJ, this is something that we talk a lot about, but do you want to dig a little bit more into wallet permissions and how they play in terms of tokens and NFTs and all that other stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in DeFi, whenever you're transacting anywhere, you need to sign a signature. You'll get a pop up. Um, if it's a hot wallet, you just have to click accept. If it's a cold wallet, you click accept. And then a second step is to confirm it on the physical device. Um, in terms of security, you know, obviously you never want to connect anywhere that you're not familiar with triple check locations in terms of, you know, are you getting this from a tweet? Uh, are you trying to mint an NFT? Are you trying to visit a tokens website? Check, check and check. So there are not enough ways in the world to keep yourself safe. Although there are great, great things that you can do right now to keep yourself safe. For example, Number one, if you are signing something, if it is a token approval, you can always revoke that. So for example, let's talk NFTs for a second. You go and you, you buy an NFT on OpenSea. Two days later, you want to go sell it. Awesome. You list your NFT on OpenSea. Let's say you have three or four of them. Uh, you only wanted to sell one. You list the one, it sells. The OpenSea smart contract still has access to take the other three NFTs from your wallet and move them to a different wallet. So an example would be to use a, a token revoking tool like Ever Revoke. Uh, you can use EtherScan, any of the scans have a revoke uh, function. But what it does is it takes that signature away from OpenSea in this case. We've seen exploits, we've seen hacks where people have lost NFTs worth six figures, seven figures, because you know these platforms have had unlimited access to the tokens or NFTs, which NFTs are also a type of token in your wallet. So, you know, one big tip that I will give is revoke permissions if you are not actively trading that token. Ty, hit us with another one. If somebody reaches out to you, it's a scam, always. Like, yeah. like there is no scenario where somebody reaches out to you via Twitter, Discord, Telegram, where you should respond and interact and give them any kind of information. Like, if it's too good to be true, it is. Um, and like, there's no reason you should ever respond. So one thing that you can do is go into discord, turn your DMS off, go into telegram, make sure that nobody can reach out to you. If somebody really needs to get in touch with you, they'll reach out through a friend. The other thing I would say too, and I know as tedious as this sounds, but when you're making a non-custodial wallet, you're given your seed phrase, which are your keys to access that wallet and it's 12 words in a very specific order, don't copy and paste that and message it to yourself, whether that's iMessage, text message, email, like you do not want any digital, like, how do I call it? Like a digital trail of your seed phrase online. Cause once it's online, it's online forever. Um, and what you can do is you should write it down on a piece of paper and keep that safe. I know people who have written down their seed phrases, laminated them, like put them in a fireproof safe, like God forbid anything happen. But like, that's the, that's the level of intention that you should have with protecting something like that. Because ultimately your wallet is holding all these digital assets that do have monetary value. Nobody will ever need your seed phrase ever period, except for you. Yep. Yeah, literally, like you see that it's red flags popping up. And like the reason why we're putting so much emphasis on this, because like your seed phrase, your seed phrase, again, are your keys to your wallet that allows you to interact with all things DeFi. And with that actually comes like this cultivating of your digital identity. Yeah. Speaking of uh, digital identity, Ty, I know you love this topic. Tell us more about how your wallet plays a role in digital identity. So you have your wallet, you have made the decision to become your own bank, right? Like I'm about ready to just take my entire paycheck in crypto, right? Like I can own all of my assets all the time. But what it really is, is my identity online and what my access to different communities are. So 
if you are familiar with NFTs, a lot of NFTs are fun for the picture, the rarity, you know, maybe sometimes they'll go up in value, but it's the community that's so valuable, right? Like proof, for example, or permies, for example, like these are really niche communities of builders that get together to share ideas. If you own a certain token, that gives you access to their ecosystem. I just had a conversation the other day with a project that is building on a, a token that's going to give you on-chain resumes. So you can take the data of the jobs that you've done for DAOs, or you can get on-chain verifications for the work that you're doing and have done. And then all you need to do to apply for a job is connect your wallet to the next job that you want. And they'll be able to see your usership, what you own, how you've used it, really creating your own credit system, right? Like if I am an avid user of crypto and not only just in it for the money to see the number go up, but I'm a, a user of ecosystems, that is going to increase my access as the internet continues to evolve and I wanna be in different things. So it goes so much just beyond like your wallet being a safe haven for your assets. It's who you are online. It's as much as who you are online as like the profile picture you use for Instagram, right? It's your identity. We're starting to see this trickle of things convert from web three or web two over into their web three versions. It's almost like a, an evolution, if you will. And the wallet is kind of at the root of all of it. Like if you don't have a wallet, you can't participate. Like if you don't have a wallet, you can't build your digital identity. They're called wallets, right? And everyone assumes that wallets just hold funds. But in this case, your wallet holds you and who you are and what you've done and what you're going to do. It's not just a, a wallet to hold your Ethereum. It's so much more than that. And that's why you got to keep it safe. And I think, guys, that's the long and short of it on wallets. What do we say? That's the long, that's the and, the long short and short of it, of it on, on wallets. wallets. And that's the long and short of it on DeFi wallets, guys. Hope you enjoyed this episode. We look forward to making so many more, breaking all the various topics around Web3 down just for you guys. Absolutely. Until next time. Bye.